Nathan Christensen. I own Raven Ridge Farm with my partner Cassidy, who's the lady over there. Um, we're a two-year certified organic vegetable farm. Uh, we do a CSA, farmer's market. We have a farm stand in our driveway, and we sell to a couple restaurants. Hey guys, and come on in. Yeah, and I'm very excited to be talking about seed starting because, as I just mentioned, we have a nice nursery space now, and so I feel like I can live out all my dreams and my expectations can, can uh, unfold. So, um, this is a really broad topic. There's a lot to talk about. We're just gonna skim through the different components in seed starting. Please like raise your hand or just interrupt me whenever you want, and we can talk about questions. I'm a resource for you guys. I'm here to help you guys out. Um, so, Got a quick little outline here. Uh, we'll start off with the advantages to seed starting. So we kind of have our intent and our reasoning and beliefs about why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about choosing the correct containers. We'll talk about the potting mix that goes in those containers. Talk about your nursery space. I'm going to use the word nursery, propagation house, greenhouse. I know that many people don't have that. So whether it's a shelf in your kitchen or a closet or a basement, just know if I'm using some of those terms, we're talking about where your seedlings are actually living, okay? We'll talk about watering, which is a very tricky subject and is more, more beneficial to just experience it, um, the good and the bad of watering and underwatering and all that, but I've got some tips and what to look for. We'll talk about potting up, what potting up is, when to pot up, what to pot up. Um, I'll go a little bit into seed, but obviously we're at Free the Seeds event and there's many people talking about seeds more specifically, so that'll be very brief, okay? All right, so let's get going with advantages to seed starting. Um, this picture here looks like we just planted a round of brassicas in like the middle of April. And so one of the biggest uh, advantages that I feel is season extension. So we're starting our plants in our nursery months before the ground is even ready, or a few weeks before the ground is even ready. And in a short growing season, the more food you can grow in that short amount of time, the better, okay? So what we try and do is we have plants that are ready to go into the ground when the ground is ready to be worked. We don't wanna wait and start our seeds when the ground is already ready to be worked because we're losing time, okay? Um, so that's a huge benefit. And that's all controlled in our nursery when we can start things when we want. Um, increased germination and plant health uh, in the controlled environment of your nursery or your growing space, you're going to have much higher germination rates um, than you would direct sowing things out in your field. Okay, so that's saving you time, saving you potting mix, you're ensuring that um, your crops are going to be strong and healthy. Um, we're going to outpace the weeds, okay? So literally and physically, when you plant a nice transplant that you started from seed, into the ground, you're instantly creating a, can a plant canopy, okay? It's shading the ground around the base of the plant so that weeds, if they germinate, they're gonna be leggy, they're not gonna be very viable, they should be easy to remove. Second part about pacing the weeds is pre-weeding your beds before there's plants in them, okay? So in April, you've got your broccoli plants growing in your nursery, you might be able to be working your soil what you can be doing is germinating and growing weeds in your beds before there's plants in them, and then you can remove them. Whether you do that mechanically with a hand tool or you do that with a tarp. Tarps are very popular on small farms and gardens right now. A fancy word for using tarps to smother weeds is occultation. Uh, I find tarps much simpler to use. But essentially what you would do is you would water your beds or water your garden and put a tarp over it. This tarp is not letting light through. It's a black tarp. Many of the silage tarps are black on one side and white on the other. Um, but you're watering your bed. You're putting the tarp over it. That germinates weeds. Weeds don't really need, seeds don't really need much light to germinate. So they're going to germinate, but then they're going to instantly die because there's no light there. So that's another benefit of starting your seeds indoors. Because while your seeds are growing and getting all healthy, you can be managing that up front, okay? So it's kind of a proactive way to outpace your weeds. Another benefit of seed starting, scheduled successions. So 
if you start broccoli once in your seed growing space, you're gonna have broccoli once in the summer. On our farm, we plant broccoli in our nursery six times. And what that does is it allows us to harvest broccoli during most of the growing season. And even as a home gardener, this is something that you can have. This is something that you can do. This is a useful tool because you can choose when you want to start your seeds indoors, right? So if you want to start your broccoli seed every three weeks indoors and just plant those outside as they become ready, that's a super useful way to eat the crops that you love to grow more regularly instead of just one batch. So scheduled successions is another advantage. Um, being able to essentially control when crops are ready in your field, how consistently they are, how often they are um, available. Okay, any questions so far? Were you talking about the tarps? You said black, Does it, is that the best? Black is good because it absorbs the most amount of heat, um, and that heat, heat helps kill the weeds as well. Because I um, automatically thought about what I had already have. Yeah. Yeah, clear plastic works. Um, that's more of a solarization effect. It doesn't work as quickly and it doesn't kill all weeds, whereas a, a black tarp does. Will. I have a brown. Browns <laughs> would probably be fine. Yeah. Okay, so the final advantage is uh, decreased soil leaching, um, which is essentially we're just talking about the health of your soil. Some crops get are sown directly. The seed goes straight into the dirt and that's just how they grow. But if you have the option to transplant, I strongly recommend transplanting it, starting that seed indoors and then moving it outside. Um, when you put your seeds into the soil, you water it, the seed absorbs some of that water, it sprouts, germinates, grows, that's great. A lot of that water is just running right through your soil profile and into your water table, taking with it certain nutrients. Um, by transplanting a nice healthy plant that has a strong root ball, it's going to absorb more of that water. It's going to help stabilize and anchor your soil. Um, another thing I have here is the coral reef. If you think about what a coral reef is, it's a living organism that houses and protects all kinds of other organisms and life. And you can think of your roots very much as the same way. Um, if you talk about the rhizosphere, where all the microbial activity is going on in, around your roots, having roots in your soil as often as possible is more ideal than direct sowing seeds because um, you're able to sustain and keep that life alive. If you grow a broccoli plant and you harvest your broccoli plant and you till it in or remove the plant, all of those microscopic organisms that are thriving in that rhizosphere now have nowhere to go. Um, so if you were able to harvest that broccoli plant, remove the broccoli plant and put another plant that has a strong healthy root ball in there, that's great. You're keeping that life alive and thriving and continual. If you were to pull that broccoli plant out and put some seeds in, you're going to have to rebuild back all of that stuff that you've established. Okay. So those are the advantages I thought of when I was coming up with this presentation and the things that I think about um, that kind of give me uh, assurance and intent on why we start many of our crops indoors. So. We'll start with the first thing, and the first thing is choosing what container to use, okay? Um, there's a bunch of words, a bunch of fancy words, there's all kinds of options, um, but essentially today I'm going to be talking about an open flat, or sometimes called a mama tray, depending who you talk to, um, versus a cell flat, which has individual cells, okay? Those are mainly what we're talking. I know that there's coconut fiber pots that you can just put directly in the ground. Uh, you can like grow plants in bags now. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that. Um, but choosing the right container for what you need to do. There's two things uh, that you need to consider is you need to think about what is the amount, what is the soil volume that these seeds need to live and how long are these seeds going to live in this container. Okay. Um, and a thing to think about is sp like spinach. If you're gonna transplant spinach in your garden, you don't need to put a spinach seed in this, right? But putting a spinach seed in a cell flat, this is a 72 cell flat, meaning that there's 72 cells in it. You can find cell flats from 24 up to 200. The higher the number, the smaller the cell is getting. Um, but spinach isn't gonna be in here for very long, right? So you don't really need to use the amount of soil for that. Um, Crops that start in this, like tomatoes, 
that ultimately get potted up into this, which I'll talk about later, that's a better option because you want to start a bunch of crops in here and then you're going to pot them up into something bigger. Okay? So, what uses the mama tray and later gets potted up? Long standing crops that are going to be in your nursery for a long time tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and squash. We have tomatoes growing right now. They're obviously not going to be planted in our greenhouse anytime soon. They're growing in a mama tray like this. We fill it with soil. We put we cut 10 to 15 rows in it, depending on what the crop is. We sprinkle our seed in. Those seeds are, are going to germinate, and they're going to spend three to five weeks in this mama tray, at which point they're going to be big. They're going to have depleted many of the nutrients in here. They need to move into a bigger house. So then we'll pot up our tomatoes into a forage pot. Um, they'll spend the duration of life in the forage pot, and they'll go into our greenhouse early May, middle of May. Okay. Um, we do that with spring brassicas as well. Um, if you want to get a head start on the growing season and have things like broccoli early, what you can do is you can start broccoli and cauliflower and things like this, and then you can pot them up into a six pack, which is quite a bit of soil, and then you can put a big, strong, healthy broccoli plant in the ground. If you're not growing very much food, you can put your broccoli plant in this, let it live in here longer, let it get bigger, you're going to increase its chances for a successful, healthy life out in the field, and it's also going to be ready for harvest earlier. Okay. Um, as far as the cell flats go, celery, leeks, onions, head lettuce, things that don't spend a lot of time or don't require that much soil in their cell are ideal for this. Onions, we start early and they spend a lot of time indoors, but onions are so small they don't need a ton of soil. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Summer brassicas, we're not as eager to have summer brassicas early. Being a market farm, a big part of our business is coming to market with food early. So that's why we pot up into these six packs and sometimes forage pots for broccoli so that we can have them earlier. In the summer, they're kind of on a rolling schedule. They're ready when they're ready. So what we'll do is we'll put broccoli, this is a 72, we also use 50s. We'll just direct seed broccoli seed into 50s and then those plugs will go directly into the soil when they're ready. They'll take a little bit longer because they're not spending as much time indoors. So advantages to these cell flats, they obviously save a lot of soil. Um, they're easy to move, they drain well, they usually have holes at the bottom, and they're somewhat reusable. We get a couple years out of these. It is all kind of cheap plastic, so it ultimately breaks and unfortunately has to be thrown away. Yes? Is it hard to get each individual plant out once you have 72 in there? Not really. You want to make sure that there's a nice amount of moisture so they slide out oh, easily. Okay. And it's typically kind of a pinching at the bottom. Okay. Uh, you would usually be holding them like this and pinching them and pulling them out okay. and laying them out. Um, and as a home gardener, you're probably not going to fill this thing with broccoli, but you can put similar crops in this tray. You can do two lines of broccoli seed, two lines of cauliflower, some cabbage. You know, on a smaller scale, the mama tray is still a good option going to six packs of forage pots. So all right. Yes? What's inside for you? Inside for me is a greenhouse, but you start someplace before there. So what's inside for you? So I have a I have a greenhouse um, and we do start some things inside our house really early um, and ultimately move to the greenhouse. Okay. I actually started things in the greenhouse last week, saw the forecast, and put them back in our house. <laughs> so inside for you is your house, and then in the greenhouse, dependent. Yeah, most of this stuff's taking place in the greenhouse, though. I mean, sure, super early on, like right now, yeah, we're in the house. All right, potting mix. Potting mix is tricky. There's not very much potting mix in each of these cells, but that potting mix needs to address specific characteristics to ensure that the plant is going to germinate, or the seed is going to germinate and turn into a healthy plant. You need drainage, you need a balanced pH, you need nutrients, aeration, air should be able to flow in and out of your soil, and water retention. Now this is tricky because all these things are on a spectrum and are within balance, right? You want it to hold water, but not too much water. You want it to drain, but not too quickly because you don't want to water every five minutes. Um, so these are just things to consider. Um, does anybody make their own potting mix? Do you get components and you mix it yourself? Great. Um, we did that for a long time. We really liked it. We could buy pretty much all of our ingredients locally. Um, 
it just became too much work. We're mixing 10 wheelbarrows every day of potting mix. You don't get many other things done. Um, so we now buy it pre-made. Um, I encourage making it homemade if you'd like because it is somewhat simple um, and it's just another hands-on task. It's a pretty cool experience. But you just have to keep in mind, um, you know, it's all within a balance. Um, we buy our potting mix at Pico from Ted and Big Arm. Um, we buy them in huge bulk bags, but I believe he also sells them in 40 pound bags that you might be able to find locally here. Or the next time you're driving by, just pull over and if he's there, he'll load you up a couple bags. Um, we do amend our potting mix with a few things. We buy this basic potting mix from Ted. Um, it's very nice. And then we put vermiculite in it. We put some kelp meal in it. And depending on the crop, we'll put sand in it. And sand helps with um, drainage. Kelp, kelp meal has a bunch of micronutrients um, and help with the transplanting and potting up situation. Um, and vermiculite is similar to perlite. Um, it helps with drainage and also water retention, but it also slowly releases micronutrients over time. Um, so we really like vermiculite. And we use the coarse vermiculite. Perlite and vermiculite and all these things come in different scales. We like the big, chunky, coarse ones. Um, keep in mind with uh, potting mix and compost and nutrients, um, excess is just as bad as deficiency. Um, I don't know if it's a scarcity mindset, but if you're never sure, sometimes you're like, I'm just going to put a little bit more of this in here. And sometimes that can be just as detrimental um, to it not being enough. If you're using potting mix or making your own potting mix and your plants are healthy and you're getting positive feedback, don't worry too much about all this. Um, uh, so yeah. One thing I can recommend with potting mix, um, never put dry potting mix into your mama tray or your cell flat. Um, a lot of potting mix is hydrophobic. You put your seed in there and you go to water it and it just beads and runs over. Um, so I strongly encourage getting a wheelbarrow and putting your potting mix in there, adding some water, mixing it around, adding some more water, mixing it around. It should take some time, it's a process because you're looking for this right amount of moisture. Um, you should be able to grab the potting mix and it should clump, but you should not be able to squeeze water out of it. If water's coming out of it, you need to add some more potting mix because that's just too wet. Okay. Uh, back to this though. I don't know if anyone knows John Martin Fortier. Does anyone know who he is? So he's like the hero of small farmers and gardeners of the 21st century. Uh, he published this book called The Market Gardener. It's a very valuable resource. Um, all things gardening on a small scale, mostly hand tools, no tractors or anything like that. Um, he makes his own potting mix and uh, the recipe is up there. The unit of measure he uses is a bucket, and I'm guessing it's a five gallon bucket. Um, and so he's doing three buckets of peat moss, which you can get peat moss from, P from Pico. Ted has a, uh, a piece of land up by Lake Mary Ronan where he actually harvests the peat, peat moss and dries it and implements it into his potting mix, and then he'll sell it in bulk bags as well. Um, perlite, compost, garden soil, blood meal, and agricultural lime. So, um, without going into all this in extreme detail, peat moss is the basis of a bunch of potting mix. That's usually what it is. It's also very acidic and lowers the pH. So I'm thinking that he puts the agricultural lime in there because that's calcium carbonate and that raises the pH um, to make it that balance, right? Because everything's a balance. Um, blood meal is going to be the nutrients. Blood meal is often dehydrated byproduct from slaughterhouses. Sounds disgusting. Um, but it feeds the plants well. Um, the garden soil is probably for microbial life, um, and compost is compost. All right. So, any questions about potting mix? Yes. What you thought you can buy bags of seed starter? <laughs> of, that. of seed? What, what is what is that? Seed starter? I, mean, I don't know. It's very fine stuff, and it's a potting mix. That and put your seeds in. If it works, then it's good to go, yeah. I mean, I don't think people need to send off their potting mix to a lab to get tested. I think if it's well vetted, if you know other people use it and say it works, and you get positive feedback, it works probably just fine. Well, they like sell it at Walmart. You can buy bags of seed starter. Okay, it's yeah. It's an expensive way of doing it. Large quantities. Yeah. Sure, That's but if you're so doing you're small, small quantities, 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 yeah, I'm quantity. quantity, the 40 pound bag of potting mix, I'm sure most of them work fine. Um, yeah. And even as you step up to a bigger container, or 
Well, what if you put your tomatoes in a pot on the deck or something? <coughs> Same kind of potting mix? That'd be fine, yeah. I mean, if it's going to live most of its life in there, you're going to want to refeed it nutrients because it's going to deplete those nutrients. Um, and that's kind of a whole other topic on things, but yeah. All right, so we've got the containers, we've got the potting mix. We're going to talk about the seeding room. Um, and I call it propagation house there because I know it's different for everybody. Um, but regardless of where you're starting your seeds, the goal is to control the growing conditions, right? We're trying to germinate seeds when it's zero degrees tonight, okay? Um, and we can do that in many of our spaces. Um, some just quick statistics and recommended uh, numbers, and I find a couple of them kind of funny, but daytime temperatures, 64 to 73 degrees, nighttime temperatures, 64 degrees. I don't think any of my plants have ever spent a night of their life at 64 degrees. It's quite a bit colder, um, even once they're outdoors. Uh, but those are just recommended. Um, our nursery, we heat it to 50 degrees. Um, and plants do fine there. If we're trying to germinate them, I'll talk about heat, map, heat maps soon. There's ways you can germinate them even with a cooler ambient air temperature. Um, if you're growing food in your house and starting seeds in your house, that's great because it's already probably heated to something like that. Um, so that's great. Um, maintaining humidity and some moisture is great, um, especially early on in a plant's life. I'll have a picture here I'll show you. Um, if you're in a closet or a small space, you could line it with silage tarps or mylar or panda film, uh, which is just like a maybe a two mil thick uh, plastic sheeting that essentially will help trap some moisture. Um, if you're in a clear filmed greenhouse or nursery, this probably isn't really a problem. Um, the most important thing in the seeding room and wherever you're starting your plants is going to be air circulation, especially in March and April when it's never warm enough to like open your doors or crack a window, it's really hard to have air circulation. Um, we achieve this through fans. Uh, we have fans in the ceilings of our greenhouse, but you can also do this in your house by having a box fan nearby or if there's a ceiling fan nearby. Um, indoors, inside of a home, it's not as much of an issue. Um, it's mainly when you're out in the plastic um, film greenhouse. Uh, dampening off is a fungal disease. There's a, a couple different fungal diseases that are considered dampening off, but it's when the leaves and the stems of your plant uh, have, are too wet for too long, um, and they essentially rot away and die. And this is a big problem, especially in March, especially with like tomatoes and plants that really don't want to be that wet, but you're watering them anyways. Um, just something to keep in mind. All right, so lights. Ideally, young baby plants want 14 to 17 hours of daylight, or let's just say light. Uh, as of yesterday, March 1st, we're officially over 11 hours of day length, and we're getting about two or three minutes a day. Um, so what we do is we have lights that are set on timers, and they run an hour and a half to two hours before sunrise, and an hour and a half to two hours after the sun sets, and then they're off during the night. Um, 11 hours is pretty good in March, but unfortunately it's 11 hours of gray, and so it's not very helpful. So lights are very important, uh, even if you're in a, out in a greenhouse or inside of a house, um, lights really go a long way. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of lights. Um, we use fluorescent tubes because they're cheap and they're readily available. When they run out, I can go to Home Depot. Um, yes? Do you get the Echo Green tubes? For the growing, or do you just use the regular like these? So these uh, these are T8s. Um, with fluorescent tubes, there's T12, T8, and T5. The smaller the number, the smaller di the diameter. And also, the smaller the number, the more energy efficient they are, and the more intense they are. Um, I think T12s are kind of a thing of the past. Yeah. No, no, you're good. I'm listening. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, we use those shop lights, those four-foot shop lights. Those are T8s. Uh, these tomato plants are under... Uh, T5 grow light system. I don't know if they're called eco, I'm not sure if they call eco, like what type they are. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So they're not a grow bulb as they advertise things, they're just a regular? Exactly. Um, and, you know, they're not ideal for growing plants, but unless you're like an aquaponics greenhouse or huge warehouse, they're good enough for a gardener. Um, very few light bulbs 
except the new full spectrum LED lights are providing all of the wave lengths, the spectrum of light that plants need. They have different parts and they're all a little different. Um, HID or high intensity discharge bulbs, those are your metal halide lights and your high pressure sodium. They give off a lot of heat, which is good if temperature is an issue. They cost a lot of money. Um, LEDs are kind of the new hot thing. Um, the full spectrum LED lights, if you see them, they're oftentimes pink. They're providing blue wavelength and red light to the plants, um, which they like a little bit of both. They're very expensive. Um, they do last a long time, and they're more energy efficient, so they actually pay themselves off rather quickly. Um, I think LED bulbs are rated for 50,000 hours, and most of these shop lights are like 10,000 hours or less. So if you run the numbers, and you feel fancy, I'd recommend getting some LED lights, <laughs> and I can come check them out because I don't have any. And I think they're really great. So um, that's kind of it for lights. Ideally, you want to be, if you're using fluorescent bulbs, they don't give off that much heat, so you can get pretty close to the plant. Those shop lights there are too far away. I'd recommend being closer to that. Four, four inches to eight inches, that's probably more like a foot. Um, your plants will tell you. If you have lights and your plants are still looking leggy, lower the lights. Our lights are all on chains and hooks, little S hooks, so that we can just adjust them as the plants grow. Or if our plants are telling us, hey, I'm leggy and I'm under light, we can lower them or bring them down lower. Okay. So these are all supplemental lights to, to daylight in these situations. If you're growing in an area that doesn't have daylight, it's the same principle? Same principle and more important, yeah. yeah you leave them on all the time, or leave them on for 14 hours. <coughs> yeah, I would go for 14 or 17 hours a day. Okay. Um, we do use nights or lights in our greenhouse, um, in our clear film greenhouse. We still do because it's just so great yeah. that things just don't look that happy. Uh, the snow is, I think, like five feet high on the sides right now, so the plants near the sides aren't getting any light. So that's important. Uh, heat mats. Heat mats are one of the cheapest and easiest ways to ensure strong, high percent germination. Uh, we use these mats right here. We get them from Amazon and they cost like 30 bucks and they're four feet by 20 inches so you can essentially get four of these on there which is pretty good at the same time you get what you pay for you can't adjust the temperature on these you plug them in I think they're preset to very very hot uh, so just be aware of that especially as it starts warming up and you get direct sunlight maybe we don't need these heat mats on our squash and cucumbers because it's already 85 degrees in this grow space okay uh, but this time of year, if you're trying to germinate any warm weather crops, heat mats are a great way to go. Um, seeds require a higher temperature to germinate than they do to live and grow. Uh, so heat mats are specifically used for germination. Uh, usually if our tomato tray germinates, we move it off and put something else on there that needs to germinate. Uh, it just kind of depends on what you're growing and what you have going on. Um, keep in mind that if you implement heat mats, your watering schedule is going to change dramatically. You're gonna water twice as often or even more because your soil is gonna be, be drying out from the bottom much more quickly. So just be aware of that. All right, so we'll talk about watering these seedlings. Uh, now that we have our grow space and we have our containers and the soils in the containers and there's life happening. Um, I feel kind of silly talking about watering because I think it is such an observational an in intuition based uh, task that it's kind of hard. Um, you have to learn through experiences. You have to drown some plants and kill them, and you need to dry some plants out and kill them to really get your hand on um, what's the nice balance. But I have some things to consider and some tips maybe that will help y'all. Um, some of these might be obvious, I don't know. But uh, different size cells need different amounts of water. So. If I water this tray and I water this tray, this, these cells do not need as much water as I need to put in this pot. I'd also bet that these cells are gonna dry out faster than this pot because there's more soil in here. So, if you have different sized pots and trays in your situation, one thing you can do is group your similar trays together. Um, we have all of our plants that are in four inch pots in one area, we have all of our mama trays in one area, so that when we go to water, we can look at the plant, we know what tray that is, and we can you know, adjust accordingly. Um, think about the location of where your plants are living. 
If you have shelving in your house and it's next to a baseboard heater, those plants down low are probably going to dry out because they're closer to the heater, right? Um, if you have fans, the uh, trays that are closest to your fans are going to dry out soonest. Um, just kind of know your greenhouse space or your growing space. You should be able to visualize how air moves through it, how the heat moves through it, and then you can essentially customize the needs based on that. Okay. Um, I know the angle that our nursery sits. I know how the sun comes over. I know when it hits these trees over here. And so I'm thinking about all of that when I'm placing my trays and also when I'm watering. Um, check the weather. Okay. If it's going to be sunny and 80 degrees and the forecast looks sunny and 80 degrees, try and be a little more proactive and know, okay, these guys are going to need more water than they had needed previously. Okay. So checking the weather. If you guys are growing food and starting your own food, you're probably a weather nerd already. Um, I check the weather a few times a day, and I check multiple sources, and none of them are ever right, but <laughs> I create like an average in my mind. I'm like, okay, these guys are saying that. But yeah, check the weather um, and just being proactive. And then I mentioned dampening off again, especially this time of year. That's when it's going to happen. Overwatering, stagnant air, moist, cool air. Um, you're going to see fungal diseases. Any questions about watering? Right. Yes. I'm a real beginner. Bear with me. Do you want them to stay moist all the time, or does it depend on the plant you're growing? Kind of depends on the plant that okay. you're growing. Um, some plants don't really want like wet feet, um, like your cucurbits, like your squash and your cucumbers. Um, the best thing to do, especially if they're, it's kind of hard to fit your finger in this cell here, but you can just put your finger in there and feel. I mean, if the top half inch is dry, but you go a little bit deeper where the roots are, and it's moist, you're fine. Okay. Another thing you can do is, it seems traumatizing, but you can pull the plug out and look at it. Examine the root for a second. Is it moist? Is it dry? Is, do I pull it out and all the dirt falls off of it? Because then it's probably a little dry. Um, so just pulling it out and observing it, putting it back in, uh, shouldn't be too stressful for it. So, all right. So a couple tips that I could recommend is uh, know what mechanism or what you're watering with. Are you using a garden hose with a wand? Are you using a watering can? Um, they all have different flow rates. They all put out different amounts of water in the same amount of time. I have watering cans that I'll keep on a plant for half a second. I have watering cans that I'll keep on a plant for three seconds. It just depends. Um, watering in the mid-mornings is a good recommendation. Most of these things are very important early spring because that's when you're most vulnerable. In the heat of the summer, you're going to be watering a couple times a day and you just know that. Um, but mid-morning waterings are nice. Uh, you've let the low temperatures, um, they're a thing in the past, it's gotten a few degrees warmer. If you water 10 or 11 a.m., you're giving your plant a few, or the most amount of hours of the heat of the day to dry their leaves um, and get ready to go into the nighttime when it's cooler and darker and air condenses. Okay, so mid-morning waterings are a good thing to go. Uh, this might not be in your context, but on my farm or if you share your garden with your spouse or you guys work on it together, have you heard too many cooks in the kitchen? Okay, watering is totally that. Honey, you killed the tomato plants, right? <laughs> I water the tomato plants. so. Limiting it to one person, because it is such an observational um, task, is a really good way to just make sure, because that person who's watering, they're in there every day, they know what, when they're watered last, and they know the weather, and they know when it needs to be watered. If you water it one day and Uncle Carl waters it the next day, and then you water it the next day and Uncle Carl waters it the day after that, you're going to run into issues, because you guys have different um, observations, uh, different opinions on things. So limiting <coughs> watering to one person let them be in charge of that duty is a good way to go. Um, taking notes is important. Continual, constant observation. Um, we, at our farm, we have a seed log. We have a log when everything's seeded in the nursery, when it's potted up, when it's put in the field. We also have a log that says plants feelings from year to year. And we just take notes, not so much about dates and those statistics, but the weather was this, this is what happened to our tomatoes, this is why I think it happened. And if you have that from year to year, you have reference points. Especially like right now, it's like, okay, I'm going to go see what I wrote at 
the beginning of March this year, or last year, the year before, the year before, just to kind of remind yourself. Seems like every spring you forget everything you ever knew uh, about growing, somehow it comes back to you. Um, if you can control the water temperature, water with lukewarm water. Um, in our nursery we have a frost free, so it's like you know 55 degree cool well water. I don't really have any control over that, but early on and in our house we use a watering can. If you can do lukewarm water, it's not going to shock the plant so much. It's kind of like throwing a bucket of cold water on someone. It doesn't. It kind of, and we don't want that. We want ideal growing conditions for your plants. So not warm water, not hot water. I think lukewarm uh, is a good way to go. All right. So I'm going to talk about potting up. Uh, potting up, the definition is transferring seedlings from small cells to bigger ones. Um, we only pot up crops that are going to be in there for, yes? Sorry, I'm back on the water just for a quick yeah. second. Um, is there a difference between water dripping on the plant and under the plant? That's so bottom watering is becoming a very popular thing. Uh, the idea is that that's how roots, they reach down, they get strong, they pull water up. Um, I think bottom watering is fine. I don't personally do it. What about when it gets hot? Because I've noticed that when you, if you don't water, when it gets hot, it actually burns the leaves. Is that? Uh, so as far as watering, cooling off the plant? Yeah. I think absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There's an ambient air temperature that's warm. That plant tissue is warm. Uh, so cooling it off in that sense, I think is good. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes we'll go in there, even if the plants don't really need watering, but it's like 85 or 90 degrees in the nursery and we can't do anything about lowering the temperature. I'll just go in there and spray them off. Just keep them Not so much to water them, but just to cool them off, literally. Yeah, good question. Um, all right, so potting up. We don't pot up everything. We pot up plants to put bigger transplants into the ground, and we pot up plants to, well, I have a few benefits here. We'll just go through those first. So extra root space. All right, so your mama tray, I've got 150 tomatoes in here. They're three weeks old. I need to move them out of the house and move them into a bigger space, okay? So that's one reason why we pot up. It also replenishes their nutrients. So you're putting fresh potting mix back into those pots. Um, and so we do it for that reason. And also larger plant starts, early harvest, talks about that. It also helps you buy time. If you've got broccoli plants that are ready to be planted, and it's still, maybe the snow's gone, but now you have a pond in your garden. You can pot up those plants to buy yourself a few more weeks. It's more costly and more, and costs more time, um, but we've done that before. We've had tomatoes that are ready to go. Unfortunately, the weather isn't working with us, so we'll put these into gallon pots, which isn't that fun, but it works out. It's fine. Um, it's also an opportunity to high grade. If you've got two lines of cauliflower in your tray and there's 25 little babies in there and you know you want to put 20 cauliflower plants in your garden, pick the 20 nicest ones. We high grade all the time on the farm, from harvesting to planting our garlic, uh, but also in the nursery. It's a good opportunity um, to kind of get rid of the puny ones. They might reach maturity and you might be able to harvest them, but I can go out in the field and point at the plants that were probably weak little stunted seedlings, they never really recover. Um, That's so hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah it is. And especially, especially in our garden, sometimes it's like, okay, we need to plant 200 cauliflowers, only 180 of them are nice, we have to plant 20 weaklings, yeah. But uh, it's less work for you, so just throw them over your shoulder, or eat them. <laughs> Yellow microgreen there to eat. Um, so, yeah. any questions about potting up? Yeah. Um, in the instance of getting root bound in pots? Yes, yeah, that's a good a good point, and I should have mentioned that. So you want to check your roots. As I mentioned, to check the moisture, you can pull your plants out of plugs and look at them. Um, you shouldn't have oh, just a white mass of really coarse roots just wrapped all around it. It's root bound. It's essentially going to be choked out and slowly die. Um, so that's another reason you would pot up something. Or just go plant it in the garden as soon as you can. Um, so, especially like with the six packs and the cell flats, they're really easy to pop the plug out and check it out and see what's going on. Um, and a lot of times you think your plant is going to be really nice and healthy and you wait another week and it starts going downhill and you look and you realize that you missed that window of opportunity of when you have a really nice formed root ball versus having something that's root bound. So, yeah, it's all about observation. 
Okay, so a couple things to be aware of. All right, minimize your root breakage, okay? There are thousands of roots on each of these baby plants. Many of them you cannot even see. So when you go to pot up, if you're going from a mama tray to a six pack, essentially what we do is we stick our hands down to the bottom and we lift up a clump, okay? And from that clump, you kind of have to act like a surgeon a little bit and you pull those all apart to go in here. We kind of talk about, you know, like a bird hunting dog, soft mouth. You don't want to be pinching anything too hard, no erratic movements. You're essentially playing operation with these plants. You're going to break their roots, it's inevitable, but if you can minimize it, that's great. Okay. Once you do break it off, the safest place to hold the plant is at the base of the stem, where the soil and the uh, stem come out of, hold it at the base. That's where it's the thickest and the strongest. When you're going into here, what we do is we'll oftentimes use our finger. This is already packed with soil, right? Moist soil that we mixed in our wheelbarrow. And we use our finger, we push it into the bottom, and we make a big tornado, we make a big deep hole, okay? Even deeper than you might think to place that plant in here. You wanna get the roots right side down. And so you're going in, you don't wanna be having to shove the roots from this little baby plant. And you also don't want to J-root. J-rooting is when you're putting your roots in and essentially they get folded up. You might not notice it, you plant it and go. A couple weeks later you can have roots popping out of your soil surface, okay? And the plant's slowly going to die. It doesn't want light. Um, so making sure you go all the way down to the end, feel the plastic at the bottom, and make it nice and wide. It can be tricky. If you let your plants get too big in your monotrade, they're going to have a more developed root system. This might be kind of difficult. You might need to bump up to a bigger size, just depending. But at this point, this is the most stressful thing that they've dealt with. They're gonna go through what's called transplant shock, okay? Their tissues have been torn up, their roots have been broken off. Um, they need to recover. And so what we do is, especially if there's sun in the forecast and it's gonna be warm, after we're done potting up, whatever we're potting up, we'll put it down in the shade and just let it recover, let it begin rebuilding its tissue, um, and it should be fine in a couple days. If, does anyone grow eggplant from seed? Eggplant looks, every year I have to remind myself it's not gonna die. Eggplant looks terrible for like five days. It just is wilted and you think you killed it, but it comes back and it just goes through transplant shock. Another thing you can do at this time is you can water in what you potted up with kelp meal. Kelp meal helps with transplant shock. It's got B vitamins and micronutrients um, and it's kind of just like an age-old amendment that a lot of people use for transplanting, okay? Any questions? When you put it down in the shade, is that just to slow down the uh, growth so it can recover a little bit before you bring it back out? Or why, why do you put it in Mainly the because it's, it's, like, it's tired and exhausted and you don't want the hot sun just like feeding it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if it's, a cloud, if it's, if it's cloudy, um, it's probably fine where it is. Okay. But it just helps in the recovery process. It's like taking a nap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we do that for about 72 hours and then we put it back up. Okay. So the final step is uh, hardening off your plants or what uh, some people call horta torture. Okay. <laughs> so what it is, you're transitioning your plants that have been born and raised in a protected space towards the outdoors where there's real elements going on. There's real weather, there's direct sunlight, there's strong winds, there's a less scheduled watering cycle. Maybe it's gonna water too much and flood everything. It's just not used to that yet, okay? Um, it's a gradual process if you have the time and energy to do it. Um, what people recommend, put them outside for two hours, bring them back inside. Next day, go for four hours, bring them back inside, so on and so forth. We don't have time for that in our context. And so what we do is we have pallets outside of our nursery. Whatever's gonna get planted two days out, we put it outside our nursery on the pallets. Um, we continue watering them regularly. At night, we put row cover over them because that's what they're gonna get. That's standard practice for us. They're gonna get row cover over them when they get planted in the field. So we might as well just do it now. That buys them a couple degrees, keeps them a little more comfortable. If you can harden them off in a partially protected space, that's great. Um, where our pallets are located, they don't get early morning sun, 
There's another structure that protects them from late afternoon sun, also acts as a windbreak. So not to kick them out of the house too abruptly, a smooth transition is really gonna help your plants once they're planted in the ground and start going from there. Cool. All right, any questions on hardening off? Does anyone harden off their plants or is what this does, new? What does the kelp meal do? So the kelp meal, we also apply that when we plant these into the ground. Um, so as I mentioned, when we pot them up, we water them in with kelp meal. When we plant these in the ground, uh, we'll pull these, we'll pull the plant out of the plug, and we have water-soluble kelp meal in a five-gallon bucket, and we soak the roots a couple seconds, and then we go and put it in. It's already partially watered in at that point, and it's got those micronutrients. It's just a little, a little boost. It's like drinking like those emergency packets. <laughs> it's like a little, a little support to help you. Where do you get kelp meal? Uh, you can get it all over the place. We buy it at Box of Rain. Um, they sell it. It's affordable. You can get maybe it's like a five-pound box. It doesn't cost too much, and it goes a long way. So, if you're applying it that way, you want to make sure it's water soluble. There is kelp meal that uh, does not dissolve in water. So, all right. So, choosing the right seed. There's specific lectures on this, so I'm not going to talk about it, but we're essentially looking for seeds that are adapted to our region. As far as what plant hardiness zone we are in, people argue about this. Some people think they're in zone three. Zone three is negative 30 to negative 40 degrees. And what that temperature is, is the coldest recorded temperature for that year, averaged over many years. So I would say that our average cold temperature is not negative 40 degrees where we are. And we're not talking wind chill or when your weather station says feels like blank. It's, uh, it's the true temperature. Uh, if you're not sure what your hardiness zone is or you haven't checked since 2012, they've mostly been boosted. They've all gone uh, into a warmer zone, generally speaking. And this is because of the amount of data and mapping technologies, GIS, people who make maps, and the data they use to make these maps are becoming much more precise. They're accounting for elevation. If you're in a city, they consider urban heat not very relevant to us. They account for if you live near a huge body of water, um, which is a heat mass uh, that helps regulate temperature a little bit more. So now when you look at a map, it's very detailed. Even if you zoom in on our valley, it's much more detailed than the, the old map is just like, this is all the same. And it's not, we all know there's microclimates all over just our small valley. So that's just kind of cool to look at, especially if you're looking at perennial crops, that's where it's more relevant for, not so much annual, but you can remind yourself how cold of a place we live in when you look at that. Um, we have about 100 frost-free days. That's different. If you know Judy at Terrapin Farm, I think she has like 50. Um, it just really depends where you are. We did have a frost on the 4th of July, but that also can just happen. So when you're looking at your seeds, most of your seed packets will have days to maturity. And if you're looking for a celery, celery spends a ton of time in the field. Choose the 90-day celery. Don't get the 140-day celery because it looks nice. Um, be reasonable with where we are and what your expectations should be. Um, as far as hybrid heirloom open pollinated seeds, we use all three. Um, because we're a production based farm, we do use a lot of hybrid seeds, which are bred for positive traits, production, uniformity, flavor. Um, heirloom obviously is not, everyone knows what the heirloom tomatoes look like. Like those are not, um, you know, meant to be uniform, right? They're the same, essentially, gene that's been passed on for a really long time. Uh, and then as far as whether you get certified organic seeds or not, we are certified organic, so we are supposed to get certified organic seeds. There's some loopholes where you don't, um, but that's just kind of a personal thing, how you feel about that. Uh, if you are using seeds that do not say certified organic, there were probably herbicides and different fertilizers that we would all agree are not that good for growing food. Uh, that's where that seed came from, so just think about that. Um, some local seed sources are the Good Seed Company and Triple Divide Seed. Robin's with the Good Seed Company here in the Valley, and Judy's part of the Triple Divide Seed Seed Cooperative. They all sell seeds that are ideal for growing in this climate. Okay, They've been adapted for early emergence. Um, 
and they're tough crops that are meant to grow well here, okay? Yes. Before I forget, is it one seedling per cell or does it depend on the plant? Uh, it kind of depends. I actually brought some basil. We have like five minutes and I wanted to plant some basil, but something like basil, I might drop like three or four seeds in there because it's okay to grow as a bush. Um, what I would do to not waste space, depending on the crop, plant two, because if you only want one in there, you can just go by and, and pluck them out or eat them as microgreens later. So it really just kind of depends on, on what it is. But yeah, on these, we'll do 10 to 15 rows and then seeds maybe a half inch to an inch apart depending on what the seed is within that row. Um, so you're looking at about 100, 150 seeds um, grown out of that. So, all right. So as a gardener, you wear many hats, right? This is just the very beginning of growing food. There's still a lot more after this. Um, so keep that in mind. You don't have to be an expert at any of it but you just know how, you need to know a little bit about each step, okay? So don't overthink things, it's just one step, okay? And keep in mind, your outdoor garden weighs heavily on indoor success, so that's why it matters to me. It all kind of starts now, it starts in the next month or two when you're starting things indoors, because if they don't do well, don't expect much out of your transplanted crops in your garden. So, right on, that's all I have. Um, I can answer any questions, or I can, Put some seeds out and we can plant some basil. Anybody have any questions? I have one more. Okay. I'm most concerned about humidity in our sunroom mm -hmm. um, because our house is very dry. I'm not worried about light or heat or anything like mm -hmm. that. What can we do to promote humidity like inside the house? Uh, do you have a stove? Yeah. You can put a big bucket of water on top of your stove. Okay. And, just turn and that on. water will heat up and evaporate and add some moisture into your house. Turn the stove on like low mm -hmm. or just mm -hmm. leave it? Yeah, just on low, yeah. I mean, you don't need to be boiling the water, just enough to promote some steam. Um, that's a good way to go. When you're in there watering, once you get things going, it stays generally moist, just from the water that you're putting in these plants alone, because the soil is breathing, it is, some of it is uh, evaporating out, so you're gonna have some moisture. Yeah, and then another thing, like he mentioned, is you can buy these little clear plastic tubs that you put on top of there. Um, that creates a little atmosphere for moisture. So and we you can get those in like box of rain. We put a fountain in our summer. Yeah. So the fountain is kind of, you know, mood or whatever. You enjoy the fountain, but it also adds uh, humidity to the sun. Yep. Even the Conrad Mansion has that little waterfall thing in there. Yeah. Probably there for a reason. Old, yeah. Old times. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Thanks when for listening, you, guys. Yeah. When you harden your plants, do you put caps on the end of your rows for your uh, hardening process? What do you mean by uh, your tubes? Do I put tubes on the... No, you know your tubes that you put over for your hardening process when you... Oh, yeah. Do you cap the ends or do you leave them open? I'm not sure I, I follow. So Perfect. when you put your tube over, over yeah, do you cover the ends as well? Or do you leave the ends open? Okay, the ends are covered. Okay. Yeah, like the row cover? Yeah. The cloth? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so we have our hoops. Okay. Um, which are usually just those little wire hoops like you saw with those kale plants, yeah. or we get a 10 foot uh, conduit, yeah. the half inch conduit that you can bend, and that usually covers like two or three beds. I just know people have left the ends open for the airflow, and I just wondering if that was a good process or not. You know, from my experience, that just creates a sail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it usually just ca catches, the wind catches it and yeah. takes it off. So yeah, we cover it down, um, you know, so if you have a, a 25 foot bed, maybe consider cutting that sheet to 30 feet or something, knowing that you're gonna cover the ends. What's the recognition that a plant is hardened? Is it when it turns kind of purplish on the stem or is, it, is there a recognized it's, it, trait? Not like that, not so much. Okay. No, I would just give it a couple days. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. give it a couple days, let it experience a couple cool Montana nights and then keep watering it regularly. But yeah, okay. the main thing on that is to not freak the plant out too much is to put it somewhere that's partially protected. Okay. Even if it's just some minor windbreaks or some minor shade near some structures, that would go a long way. If you put them out in the field, they're just gonna like look terrible. You'd be kicking them out of the nest too quickly. So, right on. Thanks again guys for coming out. I hope you guys listen to some other fun talks. <laughs>